Welcome to the Better Pairs Podcast. Join Dr. Jason Fujikawa for his insights on theology, philosophy, culture, and the verbal expressions we use to relate meaning and reality to one another. Make no mistake, this is a podcast for nerds, but particular nerds who are searching for old wisdom made ever new. To learn more about the Better Pairs cultural empire, please visit betterpairs.com. Hello, this is Dr. Jason Fujikawa. I have some very exciting news to share with you today about our inaugural Better Pairs course that is beginning on May 30th in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area. Over five weekly in-person sessions on Tuesday evenings, the inaugural fellowship will be reading Book 1 of St. Augustine's Confessions in the original Latin. For our adult listeners in Oklahoma, there are only a limited number of seats at the table for this fellowship, so it is Council of Elrond time to step up and claim your spot through the link in the show notes for this episode or by visiting betterpairs.com. What can you expect from the course? Each of the five two-hour weekly sessions will take place in an actual home or hobbit hole where the fellows will gather around at a table over light refreshments, including some fresh pears. I will serve as the inaugural guide and invite fellows to read sentences of the Latin text and then construe for the benefit of the fellowship their interpretation of the Latin. The focus is not on a translation into English, but rather the meaning of reality conveyed and retained in the original text. This is not a Latin class. There are no grades. There is no competition. This is a Latin reading fellowship. You will not be alone. Our guides have traveled these passages before. Your fellows are expected to have had an intermediate proficiency in the language to be read. Again, they are expected to have had an intermediate proficiency in the language to be read. By this I mean it might have been many years or decades since you have formally or informally but intentionally studied Latin. However, something remains under all that rust. A good online test for one's proficiency is hosted by the National Latin Exam, and a link to the test with some helpful instruction is included on the course webpage. The goal is to be able to eventually read the passages of a given ancient author with only the assistance of a selected glossary of uncommon terms appearing in the passage. In the beginning of each course, the guide does much of the heavy lifting, but the idea is that week after week, each member of the fellowship grows in confidence and facility with the language. Still, this is not a class. The analogy I use to explain the distinction between a Latin class and a Latin reading fellowship is the difference between learning to water ski and actually water skiing. Learning to water ski is only tolerable because the enjoyment of actual water skiing entices you on the other side. Sadly, for many people, their experience of Latin or ancient Greek is the equivalent of learning to water ski, i.e., becoming a human torpedo, without ever enjoying the thrill and enjoyment of actual water skiing. If you have already put in the hard work of learning an ancient language earlier in life, but stopped short of reading the early church fathers, or the greats of ancient Athens and Rome, Better Pairs courses are an opportunity to cash in on that intellectual equity. If your interest in the fellowship outpaces your proficiency in the language at present, there are a very limited number of NPC, non-player character seats, set around the fellowship table each session for those who want the experience from the relative safety of three feet back, and who may from time to time invite fellows on side quests to gather all their lost chickens. I'm excited to be offering two exclusive incentives to our first fellows. First, the inaugural fellowship is being offered at a discount of over 35% to our regular course rate. Second, each fellow securing a spot in the fellowship for the five-week course will receive a complimentary Better Pairs mug from the newly updated Better Pairs Market. Choose either the original Better Pairs mug, our Foc de Ficilia Cole Pyrum mug, or our most popular Stop Big Lexi mug. 
If you live outside the Oklahoma City metro area and would like to be considered as a site for future Better Pairs courses, please subscribe to this podcast, leave a comment, and email me at jason at betterpairs.com. If you would like to support the work of Better Pairs, please visit the Better Pairs Market and community-supported analysis pages at betterpairs.com. And now, on with the episode. Episode 9. Egregious. The folks at Merriam-Webster represent the North American branch of Big Lexi, our philological arch-villain for this season of the Better Pairs podcast. Their entry for the term, egregious, offers the contemporary definition, quote, conspicuous, especially conspicuously bad. The entry also includes an archaic meaning, distinguished, and an explanatory note that perhaps the shifting meaning from a complement to something more accusatory is the result of the ironic use of the original meaning. That's all there is to see here, people. Just a word that now means its opposite. A word to be added to the likes of cleave, inflammable, and the bi prefix in words like biweekly or biannual. As you might have guessed, I believe that there might be something more to this word which reflects our understanding of its deep etymology and perceptions of belonging to or resisting the herds or flocks. Egregious comes to us from the Latin adjective egregius, egregia, egregium. The adjective is composed of two parts, the prefix e or ex, meaning from or out of, and the root noun, grex gregis, meaning flock, usually in the context of sheep, but in some contexts it can mean a more general herd. It is important to distinguish egregious from extra gregius, namely that egregious means from or out of the flock and not from outside the flock. The noun, usually a person modified by egregious, has an origin from within the flock, not somewhere or some flock exterior to it. Those egregious individuals might be a rara avis or rare bird, but are nonetheless birds hatched from within the community itself. The E of egregious confers then a meaning similar to the E in the word election. Those elected to offices, see Community, Episode 6, are selected, that is, selectus, from the community's members. Pope Francis's papal motto is miserando atque elegendo, a phrase taken from a homily of St. Bede in reference to St. Matthew's call to follow Jesus. Elegendo, Matthew, St. Matthew, is called out, chosen from the milieu of his time and the wretched circumstances to follow the Good Shepherd. The egregious are drawn out of, literally distinguished from, the flock. Returning then, to focus our attention on the nature of flocks, in particular flocks of sheep, the literal aggregation of sheep retains some of the advantages of a fleet, as described in episode 2 of this season, Unclassical Education. The flock is able to travel faster with each sheep not having to swivel its head in a constant search for predators. Each sheep attends to his visible range and sounds the alarm if anything seems amiss. This convention is taught to the young by the old. The difference between a flock and a fleet arises when the enemy does indeed appear. Absent a shepherd, a sheep's defense, aside from perhaps a pair of horns, is his relative fitness to his kin. A fleet's strength is the coordinated strategy and tactics of the ships in unison against the threat. Of course, humans man ships. Sheep have yet to become a seafaring species, and so if they ever do construct boats on their own initiative, I suspect, though, their response to a wolf-helmed vessel at sea will be similar to their slaughter of proverbial fame on terra firma. In our historical imagination, there must have been some providence to the survival of sheep in the world prior to their domestication by humans, 
given the tastiness of mutton and a sheep's lack of any significant defense. While flocks of sheep might have been a natural phenomenon, it is the human shepherd who orders and preserves them from wars, famine, and pestilence over the millennia. Nevertheless, for the sake of humans, during wars, famine, and pestilence over the millennia. Still, this idyllic image of an Episcopal shepherd over his sheep presents the tension in the modern interpretation of the word egregious. Namely, why was being described as out of or from the flock a positive description in the ancient world when it seems that what exists outside of the flock is danger and death? Again, we stand at the abyss of deep etymology and conjecture causes to explain effects. The fruit of this exercise is not certainty or even certitude, but the habitus, the ready disposition, to ponder the weight of words which connect us to the human family over time and space. Perhaps the ancients saw the egregious sheep as the prime selection fit for sacrifice, or the prime selection for the purpose of breeding the next generation. While today we might seek out the latest tech stock, Back then, the newest development in livestock was a societal premium. Transferring the epithet to humans, a novus homo, or new man in the Roman Senate, such as Cicero, would have been seen as a sanguine shock to the ebbing bloodlines of a consular class preceding him. That is one theory for the ancient meaning of egregious, but what of the modern sense in which the term is now negative in connotation. Here there is perhaps a decoupling in the transference of the epithet. Human societies, unlike flocks of sheep, become complacent and resist changes to the status quo with intention, and sometimes violence. E egregious members of a human society are seen as agents of change, and there is a resistance to change which is transposed as resistance to the individual. Such is the nature of revolutionaries and revolutions. In the Christian revolution, that is the revolution initiated by Jesus Christ, which in the grand schema of the human family was something of a counter-revolution restoring the rightful king, we have the image, even from the first century, of Christ the Good Shepherd we are told that his sheep hear his voice and follow him, presumably leaving their flock. Which, then, is the true flock, the flock of origin or election? Does the narrow path of these egregious sheep necessitate egregious activity in the same aspect of our own Christian journey today? This drawing out of flocks seems to be God's modus operandi for the salvation of the human family. To his chosen people whom he exiled from their promised land for engaging in polytheistic worship contrary to his revelation as one, God reveals himself as a trinity of persons. To creatures imbued with the natural law to care for the young and for the young to obey their parents, Jesus comes bearing a sword, commanding his followers to deny their families, let the dead bury the dead, and come follow him. Egregious behavior indeed. The views expressed by Better Pairs contributors are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect the views of Better Pairs, its parent company, or any company or organizations affiliated with the contributors. For more information to support Better Pairs or to shop for Better Pairs merchandise, please visit betterpairs.com.